okay, everybody, I like to take a picture so I can tweet it out. So at the count of three, I would like everybody to say cheese. Actually, no, you need to say da bears. Ready? One, two, three. Good job. Thank you. So hi. Good afternoon. Welcome to the famous, historic, and just fabulous landmark in Chicago, Soldier Field. I am Teresa E. Mintel, and I am president and CEO of the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. I think most of you here know a little bit about us, but just in case, let me do a two-second commercial. We are a member organization. We've been around for 113 years. We have about 1,100 members representing over 400,000 people who work in the Chicagoland area, and our members generate over $25 billion in direct economic activity for the city of Chicago. For those of you who are our members, we thank you very much. For those of you who are here to test us out, we hope you really have a great afternoon with us. So again, thank you for being here. <clears throat> How often can you call something both historic and modern? Guess what? We're in the most historic and modern building entity in the city of Chicago. We are thrilled to be hosting the Exchange 2017 here at Soldier Field, and thank you to Soldier Field for also being a member of the Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce. Businesses from all over Chicago and from every industry are here this afternoon, and you'll have a chance to meet everybody, each other, and learn about each other's business shortly after the program when we move back over to the United Club. But in the room for the next hour, we'll learn about probably the most exciting industry in the city of Chicago. And I say that because most of us here volunteer pretty regularly during the week and definitely on the weekends to plop in front of our sofas or haul ourselves out to a stadium to enjoy what these gentlemen bring to us, and that is our professional sports teams. And boy, are we blessed here in Chicago. Not just one of the world's best entertainment, but sports is also one of our biggest economic engines here in the city of Chicago. Professional baseball alone generates $9.4 million in direct economic activity for each game that is played here in Chicago. That's pretty remarkable. There's really nothing else that does that for our local economy. And think about that. That's one baseball game from one team. What do we have here in Chicago? We have, of course, the most recent World Series champions, the Chicago Cubs, and of course the 2005 World Series champions, the Chicago White Sox. That's two baseball teams. We have two, oh, yes. <laughs> we also have two basketball teams. We've got the Bulls and we've got the Sky. We have two hockey teams, the Blackhawks and the Wolves, who are, by the way, this evening in the playoffs. We have a soccer team, that's the Chicago Fire. So happy to have them here. And we have one football team, but boy, are they a legend, and that is the Bears, our world famous Chicago Bears. Put that all together and you get skill, you've got passion, you've got thrills, and you get, again, an economic engine that is second to none in our country. The people on the stage with me right now are actually the ones behind the scenes who keep it all going. You cannot have a great sports team in Chicago these days without what the work that these gentlemen do behind the scenes. Whether it's because of the disruption the technology is bringing to every one of our industries, the competition for our time and our dollars, a very rapidly changing media marketplace, it's the work that these people do that really bring us every day those sports teams that we love so much. So I want to thank all the sports teams, every one of them is a member of the Chicagoland Chamber. And I also want to make sure that I say a big thank you to the sponsor of our panel today, and that is Microsoft, CBS Radio, and of course, 670 The Score with Lawrence Holmes. It takes teamwork amongst our businesses, amongst our business community to bring us all together like this. And we're fortunate that Chicago really has the best business community in the country. I get to travel the world and talk with chamber leaders from other cities, and I can tell you that we are absolutely the envy of other, every other city, not only because of sports teams like this, but because of our civic engagement with our business community. So again, I say thank you to all of you for your support of the chamber and for being with us today. So real, shortly here, 
like now, I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence Holmes with 670 The Score. And Lawrence, I want to thank you. You've been great working um, with you on this whole program from the from kind of conceiving it to the Q&A to the, to the work that we did on the phone call. And I want to really thank the Bears, the Fire, and the White Sox. You guys are just tremendous civic leaders here in Chicago, and we're thrilled to have you on the team. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lawrence to do the formal introductions and get this show on the road. Thanks for being here. Teresa, thank you so much. It's an honor to be in this room with members of the Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce and its guests here at the 2017 Exchange. You're the people who are the economic and jobs engine of the Chicago region. So like Teresa said, you're the very best sports fans too. And we saw that because you all took direction very well when she said, say, duh bears before the picture was taken. My name's Lawrence. I host a radio show on 670 The Score. I've been there for a long time. When I was going through the, the history of our panelists, I started thinking about that Scott and I basically like kind of came up in this industry at the same time, which is kind of scary. And I think it just means that we're all getting old. Um, you can listen to my show at six o'clock uh, every night on The Score, except for when the Cubs are on the East Coast like they are today, which is great for me because that means I get to be here with you and this exceptional panel on business of sports. The accomplishments of this group and everything they've built with their teams is so impressive that just to properly introduce each one is a daunting task, but I'll do my best. Brooks Boyer is the Chicago White Sox Vice President of Sales and Marketing. This is his 14th season with the Sox. Brooks oversees key aspects of teams' revenue generation in park entertainment and business development. With Brooks' executive leadership, the White Sox set a franchise record for attendance. He is also the co-founder of Silver Chalice Ventures, a White Sox-owned digital media company. And prior to all of that, Brooks was with the Chicago Bulls for 10 years. Now, it says here, and I am not kidding, it said, and helped them win three titles. It's my idea. It's my okay. Idea. It was a really good idea. That, that he thought about doing that. With the White Sox, of course, uh, the Sox won the World Series back in 2005, and you're looking at a two-sport champion in Brooks Boyer. What's not listed in here is his actual athletic accomplishments. He's a Division I basketball player at Notre Dame, which so that's it something to keep like in mind. So please welcome Brooks Boyer. <laughs> Scott Hagel is playing on his home turf, and we thank you very much for allowing the use of Soldier Field in this beautiful place that you have here in the Midway Club. He is Chicago Bears Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communication. He oversees eight departments, marketing, content, brand creative, community relations, events and entertainment, media relations, social media, and digital media. His approach is multicultural and focused on the consumption habits of people in different demographics. It's also global. Scott is in his 22nd season with the Bears. He started in 1996 as a public relations intern. So think about that. I mean, that to go from where he was to where he is now is pretty incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, Scott Hagel. Atul Kosla is the Chicago Fire Chief Operating Officer. Since joining the club in 2011, he has raised the team's profile, building a soccer ecosystem through year-round fan engagement. Under his direction, the Fire built Major League Soccer's second largest youth club with 16,000 players and the Chicago area's largest adult soccer league with 14,000 players. A tool oversees sponsorships, ticket sales, fan experience, stadium operations, facility management, marketing, broadcast, and digital media, PR, soccer, programming, finance, IT, HR, and the nonprofit FIRE Foundation. Aren't you like an engineer, too? <laughs> I am an engineer by trade, yes. <laughs> so you have all of those things rolled into a bag. With all that on his plate, it's a good thing his deeper background is not just at NBC Sports, but also at General Electric. Ladies and gentlemen, Atul Kosla. 
Now, many of you know that Michael Reinsdorf was scheduled to be here. And in fact, it's the reason that we got Brooks. We tricked Brooks into coming here by telling him that Michael Reinsdorf was going to be here. But the Bulls right now are getting ready for game five of their, their playoff series with the Celtics. So Michael couldn't be here because he's going to be with the team in Boston. But we thank him for at least wanting to be here with this panel. So instead of me continuing to talk, I thought that we would start things off. And I'm going to start things off with a really easy question. And this one goes to you, Scott. Um, so the Bears going to take a quarterback at number three or <laughs> got some scoop for us or? I'm totally. Well, yeah, I was going to say, how should I answer that? Yeah, no, don't it'll be it'll be exciting on Thursday night. I can promise that. Okay, that's a good place to start. So why why don't we go to talking to you guys about your your focus with social media and technology? Let's start with technology. How are your franchises using technology to engage fans? Brooks, why don't we start with you? Well, I, I, obviously, when when. You look at how people are how people communicate. One of our biggest challenges in, in our industry is how people are consuming our media and making sure that uh, we are we are where people want us to be and we are delivering our content to them on their devices where where they want them uh, whenever they want them. So for for us, when when we look at connecting with fans, we want to have a one to one relationship, one to one personal relationship with the fans as best we possibly can. And for us, whether it's coming to the ball game and, and, and checking in through our, our ballpark app or what I think you'll hear from, from all of us is, is having a presence, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, name anything, any, any social platform, you have to be able to communicate with people and that, that, digital, that digital audience, that, this phone allows us to do it in, in, in new ways and better ways to continue to develop fandom and you work with a digital media company, but BAM, uh, Major League Baseball's advanced media, has really been a market innovator as far as engagement goes, time spent on apps. How do you see that growing considering the boom that, that it had taken off with? Well, it's, it's, it's going to continue to grow because more and more people are accessing it. Uh, the, the MLB app, Bad App, is the number one app, sports app in the in the world and and people access it every single day uh, so for us if, if people are being engaged with our game or engaged with our product that's the win for us and we have to it, it now and I'm sure we'll all hit it at some point I just get to hit it first we all have data warehouses we know where tickets are going we know when people are buying food we know when they're entering the ballpark we know when they're supporting Chicago White Sox charities there's just so much more that we get to know about them and through the app, whether it's the ballpark app or MLB at bat, we're seeing how people are consuming in, in the digital world as well. Helps us as marketers be able to get to that ultimate goal of being able to connect one-to-one. -one. Scott, what do you, how does this work in the NFL? I'd, I'd say very similar to what Brooks said. I, what it does, I think more than anything, is it allows us to tailor the experience to the fan. I mean, you're going almost down to a very personal level now. Um, as Brooks said, it's how, how do you want to consume it? On what device? Do you want to watch it on your television? Is your phone, your iPad? Where are you at? Um, that's one of the big things. One of the uh, improvements that we're working with SMG here at the stadium at Soldier Field is improving the Wi-Fi infrastructure here because we know that's just part of what our fan base expects. And we have to make sure that we can deliver the experience the way they want it in a very personal way um, to keep them, you know, to basically, we call it growing the share of heart, right? We want to make sure that they're connected to the Chicago Bears in the way that works best for them. I think football is unique because the experience here is great, but the experience at home, some would even argue might be better. So how do you go about trying to have that outreach with the fan base, knowing that the product of, at home is a great product right. too? So I guess... Lawrence, that, that fits right into like, what, what do you want? And we want to make sure that we can provide an unbelievable experience here at Soldier Field. Um, football is unique. We have 16 games, 16 regular season games. Here in Chicago, we have eight home games. 
that's not a lot of opportunity to come here and take advantage of that. And I think football also, it's very much a communal sport. It brings people together. You don't find a lot of people that watch football games alone or catch a piece of it. It's about getting friends together, family together, those people that you meet in section you know, 250 that like ESPN's doing right now, a special feature on, on a bunch of season ticket holders here. And, and to be able to deliver a unique experience here at the stadium that suit suits a certain segment of our fan base so that's that's a ritual for them that's very important that tailgate out in the south lot is an important part of their fan experience and then you have others where maybe it's it's a local bar that they go to with friends or it's inviting family over at the house and it rotates so again we just have to make sure that we recognize all of those different ways that people participate in our game and make sure that we deliver the best experience possible for them. Tool, in six years now you've been in, in charge of the fire. How have you seen things change when it comes to the use of social media and, and your business plan using that? So I, I take, I guess, one step back. I think, you know, our average age for fan is mid-30s, 34, 35. It's actually gotten younger over the last three years. So where we see the biggest growth in our fan base is millennials. Uh, and that, that is what they're used to. The way they consume content first and foremost is through social channels or, or mobile. Uh, so for us, what, what tech has allowed us to do, or at least as tech advances, uh, is first and foremost capture who these fans are better than what we've done in the past. Uh, I think average in a sports team, at least in MLS, I'm not sure about the data in the other, other leagues, is you know, you, you know about 50 to 60% of the fans in a good day that are in your stadium. The others you don't know. Uh, so what tech is allowing you to do is find creative ways to find out who these people are so you can at least capture that data set. And yes, we all have data warehouses now, and then you can analyze all of it and then try to tailor an experience to them but the first step is to actually even capture these fans, which uh, in, for a long period of time, we didn't know who they, who they were. Uh, so take, take just digital ticketing as an example. Uh, as teams move to digital ticketing, as we have moved to digital ticketing, all of a sudden, you know, before I could give my ticket to, to Scott and say, hey, go, go to the game. Well, that's great. but. Now, if Scott shows up the game, I have no idea who Scott is. He's just walking in with a paper ticket. Uh, but today, when Scott walks the same, the only way he can get a ticket through our season ticket holder is through the app and, and for them to transfer the ticket to, to Scott. But that requires an email address uh, to transfer it. Uh, and then I can scan Scott's mobile at the, at the stadium. And all of a sudden, I know Scott, which I didn't know, you know two days ago. Uh, and that's very valuable in terms of finding out who these people are. So I think purely, again, at a macro level for us, from a tech standpoint, it's allowed us better ways to capture data. And then we can analyze it a, it a lot and then figure out how to customize it and deliver an experience, uh, whether it's through a social channel or whether it's through some other channels, uh, use it to, to engage with them. I actually had this experience this past weekend where I transferred my tickets to a couple of different people for the weekend at the Sox game. I'm wondering, with this new technology, the, the availability of that, how does it further what you do? Because now it seems like instead of scrambling to put the paper tickets in someone's hands, you're actually going to be able to get that person to the game a little bit easier. For sure, I mean, we get them in easier, you know who they are, uh, you hit them back up with uh, you know a traditional email message. Uh, if you realize that they, if you've got a good warehouse, you could probably even figure out that's the first time they came to your ballpark, um, and send them a message. Some of the some of the technology that's available to do that allows you to you know as a follow up note send them, hey, thank you for visiting us for the first time. Uh, would love to have you back, uh, and you kind of put them on that fan escalator model and you know get them on the first time, get them on the second time, and then hopefully they become a season ticket holder. But it all starts by being able to capture who this person is before hard to do so. But a, and a key part of that is you said it, you're providing a service mm -hmm. by making it very easy now for you to transfer your tickets, which creates a willingness then for others to, to share a little bit more or to engage a little bit more in your product. So it has to start with providing 
some type of benefit. And I think you illustrated well how, how what a benefit that does provide the fan bases. Brooks, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, they, they, they hit it. The, the ticketing ecosystem has become so efficient, whether it's secondary tickets. Uh, one of the great things about baseball, and I'm sure these guys, actually AK and I have talked about it before, is we get the data from the secondary market as well through BAM. So it's, it's, it's the same thing we've, we've talked about. Ticketing has become very easy for people, and the fear of not having that hard ticket, and that's, that's one of the things – uh, that, that we did this year. We, we still have some hard tickets. Uh, we grew up, maybe not you, you're, you're young. Uh, you, know, you went to a concert and, and you saved the ticket stub, or you went to a game and you saved the ticket stub. Uh, that's kind of gone. But people that are growing up nowadays don't have that connection with the hard ticket. We still do do some hard tickets. We still offer the opportunity for people to get hard tickets. But this has become so easy to do and so much better for our business that uh, this is the way that it's, it's gonna be and it's only gonna continue to advance. I know in, in media, whether it's radio or television, we're always trying to find the balance between advertising and programming mm -hmm. and how much is too much and do you wanna lose audience because you have too many commercials in, in a particular break. When it comes to getting the mix right, whether it's sponsorship or advertising partners, how do you go about figuring out that mix? Brooks, we'll start with you. Well, it's, it's, we've got to pay the players. <laughs> it's, 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 it's our reality, is, is whether it's through broadcast, through the, the, the league funds that, that come to us, through ticket sales, through concessions, all the different revenue streams, we have to pay attention to every single one of them. And it is a, a balance. Obviously, you don't want to um, completely over-commercialize, whether it's a player or – any of the content that you are you are sending out because at the end of the day it's still sports, uh, but we also have a job to do and it's to pay the players to try to put the best possible product out on the field for our fans. And I think you see across Chicago. I mean, the teams are very sophisticated in how they do it. Like most aren't trying to hit you over the head with it. They they weave it into the sport product that the fan base is passionate about. You know, for us in stadium, you know, we don't want to run just straight advertising. Uh, like that, but we have sponsored pieces that fit in that accomplish the goals of what the partner's looking to do, but also provides value to that fan base, whether it's it's content that's entertaining or maybe there's a benefit that comes along with it. But you're always looking for ways to to integrate it in a strategic way so it's not just overt. Have you seen it change, Scott? Where I mean, because you're talking about two decades. Oh, now. for sure. Just because all of these, all of our, we, our content production abilities have skyrocketed. I mean, ever since the digital age, when when the internet came on board, and then you're talking about social media, we all have stabs that do just that. So now you've got a direct link into your fan base, and you can provide your business partners with the opportunities to be a part of that. You know, a direct connection to our fan base. And, and weave them into, for our case, like what Bears football is about and how that also makes sense for what your partner is trying to accomplish. Atul, what have you seen? You know, I think for, for us, um, slightly different in the sense that, you know, the game is 90 minutes. We don't have commercial breaks in, in the first half or the second half. The very li FIFA limitations of what you could even market, you know, or promote during the game. Uh, so we're left with that 15-minute halftime at best. And then the rest of it is, is just the game. Uh, so we've got to be really creative what we're trying to do, whether it's all the additional marketing around the 45 minutes, what you're going to see on TV, what you're going to hear on radio, uh, and, and content, as, as, uh, as the guys mentioned. Uh, so we are, by default, a little bit limited in the commercial inventory. Uh, on the flip side, that's a positive for our partners in the sense we cannot be um, – you know, we can't have 100 partners. That's just, it's not possible. Uh, we won't be able to give them light of day. So we have to be very selective in who, who we are able to, to get and, and at what price point. And most importantly, and then I guess the second thing we look for is, are they engaging with the fan base? Uh, you know, if they're coming in to put a, put a logo on, I think they've all, all brands understand now that that probably doesn't work. Uh, but if they're coming in to provide almost a service and a value back to the fans and are willing to activate outside the stadium and during the games, 
uh, then I think they'll reap the benefit of that, of that sponsorship as well. So that's where we have found success. But again, it's for us, it's a little bit different in the sense that it's 90 minutes. I've just got 15 minutes of in-game content. Everything else go else is uh, outside outside the game. How do you compare what happens in soccer? Because soccer is fairly liberal with the use of advertising on jerseys. On it's it's different than I think baseball, football, basketball are probably going in that direction. But it, does that make it things easier for you to to approach advertisers, or more difficult when you're trying to figure out? Who goes on a, on a jersey, for example? You know, I think the jersey is an interest. I mean, it's interesting. It's, it, it's just one of one. That's you know, that's our biggest sponsorship, uh, and that is the only sponsorship. We are not even allowed. You know, we're not allowed a second patch. That's the only patch in, in front of the jersey that's available. So, what we have tried to find over the last two years, uh, not two years, six years or so, first with Quaker and now with Valspar, is find Chicago companies. That's the ideal objective, is trying to find companies that are in Chicago, want to make this home, or this is their home, uh, which right off the bat, we find that they want to engage even more with, with, with the city. Um, and then two, uh, companies that want to give back. They, they want to give back in ways beyond just, clearly there's a marketing benefit uh, to being on the jersey and just impressions and all of those sort of things, but they want to give back above and beyond uh, that in terms of uh, whether it's a foundation or uh, out, outside outside the stadium. So the jersey is unique in the sense it's it's one of one. We we are uh, we don't go out market mass We're very targeted, and the first target list we've always looked at is Chicago companies. That, uh, that have a presence and are really looking to go off that soccer audience. Scott, the next question I want to start with you. How do you judge the in-stadium experience for the fan? Uh, we're lucky we feedback from them, number one. Um, we always are trying to create a home field advantage. So that comes with different video board programming. But again, it starts as simple as arriving in the parking lot, you know, and working with your vendors that are responsible for helping get our fans into the gates and then to their seats and then once they get to their seats are we playing the right type of music is it the right type of entertainment going on on the field and how is that giving us a competitive advantage with you know generating crowd noise i mean that's that's a big thing that we talk about um so and then from there we get feedback through a variety of different ways through the fans themselves so we have uh, league personnel out at every one of our games that has checklists that they go through to make sure that we're on the right track in, in different areas. And then uh, we also have secret shops for some of the different vendors to make sure that what we're setting out to accomplish is meeting its goals. Brooks? Uh, driveway to driveway for us. Very similar to what, what Scott was talking about is what is that entire experience? We have 81 chances to wow somebody. And there's, there's always something unique. We, Scott and I were even talking about it being around as long as we have been, there's still something special, unique about an empty ballpark or an empty football stadium. And, and we have, and, and we're conditioned to it. We, we work there all the time. But there's going to be an opportunity for someone to step out onto our field or to step through the vomitories and see the green grass and smell the hot dogs and experience White Sox baseball for the first time. And there are people that come back and want to that same experience. We want to give our, ourselves a chance to wow somebody every single time they come to the game. We can't control what happens between the lines when grown men get a round ball and a round bat. We can't control that. But what we can control is the experience around them. And that's, that's food and beverage. That's music to what he talked about. It's entertainment on the video boards. It's connecting with us in different ways. That's something that, that we take a great deal of pride in, of always trying to reset the bar on ourselves because we're not going to bat a 1,000. There are going to be people, people that come to our ballpark and have a bad experience. How can we learn from that and make sure that the next time they come, we give ourselves a chance to wow somebody? When you get a, a positive re review mm -hmm. from a fan that maybe isn't happy with the team, and I know that you've had to go that through this a lot. That would not be a positive review then. It well, would be a negative review. Not happy with the team, but happy with the experience. Right of going to the game, how do you judge the value in that? Do you pat yourself on the back and say, we're doing the right thing and we have to let the, the baseball handle itself? Well, 
I think for any of us, you know, our, our, our product hasn't been great. And, and we understand that. We have to control what we can control. And if, if someone comes and has a great time and, and tells someone, you should go to the ballpark, you know, whether it's the, the food's great or, or man, I, I, I like this part of the experience or a certain promotion was, was fun. And I went out with friends and family, kind of what, what Scott was talking about. That is, that's, that's our win. But let's not, let's not get away from the fact we want to win baseball games. Our fans want us to win baseball games. And that's why we go to the, the steps that we go to because different than a lot of other sports, there's no salary cap in baseball. And so our business model is the, the revenue that's generated, net of operational expenses goes out into the field. We generate more revenue and expenses stay the same. It's more that, uh, that we can give to our baseball department to put better players out on the field. AK, what's it like for the fire? You know, we, uh, we spent, I guess, four years ago, we started this program. It's, to, it's to completely back a house. It's called Champs. Um, and it's focused on uh, all our partners, all our vendors. Um, so they are incentivized, uh, and, and we go through a ridiculous amount of training with them on basics of, uh, you know, you'll be surprised how high you get scored if you are welcoming someone, thanking them, apologizing at the right time uh <laughs> and 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 those things go go a long way with fans uh you know we can't control if we want to win a game or or lose a game what we can however control is to say thank you and welcome and uh uh make sure they as best as possible have have an experience so that program for us has done done wonders you know we were fortunate enough last year to be you know jd powers sort of the best sports experience in Chicago, primarily on the service side of things. And that's a testament to the team and it's a testament to the, to the partners that we have who've sort of really committed themselves to uh, this back of house uh, champs program. We didn't create it, we, we took it from uh, uh, Oklahoma Thunder. So uh, credit to them, they've, they've done this before. So we toured around the country, kind of figure out who does service programs well, uh, back of house to, to motivate this staff. Uh, and, and we've, we've tried to emulate, emulate that and have done it, I think, a, a decent job. We absolutely secret shop the heck out of us. Uh, we also use a metric called net promoter score. Uh, essentially, it's everyone that's going to promote you at the end of the day, give you a 9 or a 10, and you subtract everyone that's a detractor, which is who's going to essentially not recommend you. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty simple question, which is, would you recommend someone else to come back? Would you t tell a friend to come back? To, to the park, uh, and that's the basic question that we, that we ask, and if they are nine and tens, then uh, the, you know, the studies show that they will tell five other people that you should go try out, try out a game. Uh, so at the end of the day, we are in the business of wanting to be liked. Uh, we, we want them to have a good time and like us, and then tell five other people that, hey, go check this out. Uh, as I said, we can't control the, the win or loss, but we can, try to put an infrastructure in place that uh, can absorb the losses uh, by providing a good experience. Uh, there's a limit and a cap to that, don't get me wrong. Uh, the beer is colder and the hot dog is warmer <laughs> when you win. That is just, the, the, stats, will, uh, the stats will show that. Uh, you know, I am a bit of a numbers person and they'll show it to the tune of 15 points. That uh, even if, you know, same experience, you know, not changing a win versus a loss. That's roughly the change on, on how, what someone's experience is at the park. So we cannot control that variable. What we can control is at a base level we are providing that uh, experience. And nobody's waiting around to win to be able to do those things. No, like you, you do yeah. it every day yep. to make sure that you're ready to take advantage of it when it turns. When it comes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that long ago that it seemed like the amount of revenue generated from broadcasting rights was just infinite. And now like I'm starting to look and see that it's finite, that, that there, there, there is a, an end, the bubble will burst at some point. So how do you as franchises steal yourself for the day that maybe when the, the broadcast rights money isn't as large as it has been? Brooke? Sorry, well, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that I'm following Closely, as closely as I possibly can, as you see the number of cable subscribers that continue to drop and people going to these skinny bundles, these over-the-top bundles, 
and you look at some of the things that, that Major League Baseball Advanced Media had, has just done, uh, you think about this. Major League Baseball Advanced Media is a sub of Major League Baseball. BAM Tech, which was spun off of Major League Baseball Advanced Media, is the, the sub of a sub of, 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 a Major League, of Major League Baseball, of a sports property. Disney just invested a billion dollars for a third of that company. And so it's telling you where you know, the leaders in, in digital technology, digital sports delivery, of where this could be heading. And you're going to see all sorts of leagues uh, that hedge with where the consumers are. The consumers are still out there. There's just not 100 million people on cable anymore. That's shrinking as OTT rises. And we've got to deliver our content to people, the very first thing we talked about, where they are, when they want it, and how they want it. And I think our leagues especially, and, and that ultimately ends up trickling down to the clubs, we're always looking at, at ways. We have a TV deal that's, that's coming up. And we're very cognizant of, of what the landscape looks like and what that, that will be. I'm sure it's the same for the NFL and, and, and you know, go, go right down the line, NHL, MLS. Uh, everybody is looking at this and, and trying to understand this because you just don't see the Dodger deals out there anymore. The, or the Angels. The, the, yeah, right. Some of these TV deals may, may not be there, but you're still going to be delivering to audiences and – Similar to, to what we talked about, about the ticketing world becoming more efficient, uh, our content delivery is becoming more efficient as well. And, and the key is, is, at least to me, I've always said content always is the king. And the, the rights holders are the ones that are going to be holding the cards. Does the NFL even worry about this? Well, yeah, absolutely. And I think you've seen it in, in the recent deal. Well, <laughs> thir Thursday night football, right? A billion dollars, right? You should be happy. <laughs> but no, they're, they're certainly looking at it in similar ways. So for those who don't know, the NFL teams don't control the broadcast rights to regular season games. That's done at a league level, and then it's split 32, or 31, 32 ways. Um, but recently, last year, you saw it start where the Thursday night package was – was sold to Twitter, and then this year that same package was sold by the league to Amazon. So they are absolutely preparing for the migration over to digital, just like Brooke said. Like, people are watching in all sorts of different areas. You can't not be prepared and, be, and deliver what all of our best product is the game. So we have to make sure that we are where people want to consume us and we offer our best product in those space. So, I mean, it's great that the league is, is very powerful right now and that it, it has great broadcast deals, but they're not just sitting resting on their laurels thinking that this is going to go on forever. They're making sure they're paving waves and finding those next frontiers that need to be looked at to make sure that we're, you know, we're still successful. And to to that future. point, it's, it's, it's amazing what the NFL has done. They've, what, sold Thursday night to three? Yeah, three I mean, different it's, groups, it's, yeah. It's, so CBS, CBS, yeah, CBS, yeah. yeah, and 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 NFL and then Network, Verizon and through the unless that's done, but it, through Verizon through their mobile. mobile yeah. So they've sold they've sold the same game four times. Four times. Four times. I mean, Mitch Rosen's only sold something like twice or three times in, in his career. <laughs> uh, he's not even up to the NFL level. A AK, what type of challenges is it for MLS <laughs> when you see the type of money that? The NFL is bringing in, MLB is bringing in, college football broadcast rights are bringing in. How, did, how does MLS find its niche and, and its place in that? You know, I think uh, so the, we just had a new TV deal a few years ago, and that was almost 6 or 7x the previous one. So for us, the bubble isn't burst. I think we are excited to see where it's going to, to take us at, at a, just the cables uh, over, over the air side, side of things. Um, as the sport continues to grow here, I think the league is delivering an audience which is incredibly young. And, and that is a, a definite strength and a selling point that we have. Uh, where, yes, we're testing, just like anyone else is testing, uh, what we're going to do on Facebook or you know, broadcasting a game on Twitter or whatever it is. Uh, but for us, the, the main outlets is where we're seeing growth on, on our end as the product is getting better and better, the coverage is getting better and better, and the production value continues to get better and better. So there's money pouring in 
to the tune that we hadn't seen, uh, you know, 10 years ago or eight years ago in the league. Uh, the second part for us that is interesting is it is a global sport. Uh, so starting last year uh, or two years ago now, uh, we're in 150 different countries. So there is a whole new frontier of, of dollars and media rights available for the league as the sport grows uh, and, and MLS gets to be known more and more worldwide. As we get players from around the world that are playing in our, in our leagues, all of a sudden the value of that broadcast in that home country continues to, to grow. So we signed Bastion, we are the number one uh, over the air uh, programming at Eurosport for the last four weeks uh, because of Bastion. Uh, now that is value to the league is their Eurosport rights now come up for, for renewal. So there's a different or additional frontier uh, uh, at the league level because we're, we, are at a glo we are a global sport so, and we have global players. So we've got 11 nationalities in our team uh, that are playing and those countries all of a sudden should value the product that we have. If I can go back to social media for a second, Scott, I, I wanted to ask you, a lot of times when people think about the Bears, they, they think about the McCaskey family. They think about George Hallis. As you're trying to move forward and you're in charge of social media, how cognizant are you about shaping the brand and trying to move the brand forward, but also protecting the brand that's already been built? Sure. Uh, we spend a lot of time on that. And tradition is a great thing, but it can cut both ways, right? You don't want to be viewed as old or stodgy, you want to be viewed as historic, traditional, but then you want to pull that thread forward into what you are today. So we want to, we try to spend a lot of time in terms of whether it's, it's toughness, it's, it's some of the innovation that a lot of people don't understand that the Bears have been a part of since its inception from things that George Hallis did, but what we've continued to do over the course of time, and social is, is a part of that. Um, to be able to tell those stories in a way that, that is meaningful to a younger audience. Like, that's where baseball and football, we, we skew older. Like when you're looking at, you know, AK is talking about a younger uh, demo. So we're, social is our way to tell some of the stories, to kind of bring them up to speed, and then tell them why it's relevant to them and how it applies today. Yeah, our games are, are, are much more generational. Yeah. The White Sox fans, especially, it's, it's a generational thing. That's why soccer is really interesting because they don't have the generational grandparents. Well, my grandparent died or my great-grandpa died, and it's been passed down. Uh, and I think that's why they're having a little bit of a, a, a surge in the younger audience. We have some questions from the audience that we wanted to share. And, and people who are watching uh, on Facebook, we really appreciate you watching. And I think we got a couple that maybe coming through. So you see Marianne over there in the corner. So if you have uh, uh, the cards that were filled out, if you have a question, we'd love to hear it. Anybody has a question, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll bring the mic over to you. Um, we're sure that there's some. Oh, come on. You mean to tell oh. me that you've got three, these three guys in the room and you know you want to ask them a question. And now you're shy? Well, wait, wait Lawrence. Well, I, I've, I've had the pleasure of doing another panel with AK. And I want to see here, and he knows where I'm going with this. I, I want to see, it does, does he not have the best voice for soccer of anybody that could be? <laughs> I said, he should, you know. You know, the first time you said that, I was taken aback. Now I'm just, yeah. Yeah. I, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's like you want him, I, I said, it's like you want him to say, yeah, and it was a firecracker. I wish I, wish I had I, a baseball I, voice. Like, I wish I sounded like Vin Scully. You sound like the, the, you should have a broadcast. Gonna, I mean, you do everything else. I'm going to take it as a compliment. Right. I, did, I was he taking has, back the first He has the best now soccer I'm voice. With it. Do we have any questions yet so I can stop talking? <laughs> we, have, we have Billy over here. He has, has several questions, but we told him he could only ask one. Uh, you get a good one, Billy. Uh, good, good. I think I met you before, Brooks. Nice to meet you again. Um, so the first question I'll ask to start this off is a pretty easy one. You guys just started off like, over 100 craft beers now at a guaranteed rate. And the name still is kind of hard to say, but uh, <laughs> so talk about the pro. Can you talk about how easy or how fun it was to uh, get that um, going? The sampling, and, all the Yeah, we, we got <laughs> hammered like <laughs> seven straight days. Uh, no, it's, it, it's, it's an interesting, we, we talk about the fan experience. 
and you know we we weren't in a in a position to uh, to execute a what, what is a, a typical large domestic beer deal, which which potentially could limit you in 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 what you can offer to your fans. We feel very good about always resetting the bar on food and beverage, and on food I should say, and and this gave us a chance to reset the bar on beverage, and to to be able to distribute different beers, uh, especially when you see what is happening with uh, Modelo and how fast they're growing, fastest growing beer in America, uh, to, to, to have a partnership with them, uh, to bring in local flavors. For, for us, there's no secret up here, our attendance is a challenge. We know that there are a lot of people that are either selling or brewing a lot of these different craft brews uh, here in Chicago and, and in the region. Uh, for them to be able to say, I'm going to go to the ballpark and have one of my beers. It's a pretty cool thing. And it, it allows us to, to deliver a different and unique experience to our fans, which we're ultimately trying to do. So that's where that came from, and the response so far has been terrific. I thought I saw someone, like, in the back, like, jumping up and down to ask a question. Yeah, okay, good. These glasses work. That's good. <laughs> Come closer. Um, there was so much, uh, oh, also I just want to say I'm really glad, you know, that I'm here and hearing, like, the aspects of business and when it comes to sports. Um, so much was talked about tonight um, in regards to social media. Do you um, do any courses or do you do, like, a crash course with the players in regards to what is put out there, what isn't, you know, going back to, you know, protecting the brand and, you know, there... Is there, what delicate balance do you, does each one of your teams practice when it comes to that? That is a great question. Is there training for players and coaches on social media? Do you want to start? Sure, sure, I, yeah. You, you, you live, kind of, I've sorry, lived this world. So. <laughs> the, yeah, absolutely, yes. There is, we do, we do talk to our players about it a lot. Um, no different than you talk to your players too about who they represent when they go out in the public, right? All the time, it's you represent yourself, you represent your family, and you represent the Chicago Bears in everything that you do. And one of the biggest educations that we have to do, Chicago's such an awesome sports city, right? And these guys come in and they're young and they don't know any better and they think that maybe what flew back at the college or when they were in high school still flies now and it doesn't because our fan base will recognize them um, wherever they go. And I always say this is their worst enemy for a number of reasons. Number one, about what they send out potentially, but also what somebody else is capturing them doing. You know, everybody can broadcast at the, the snap of a finger. So we spend a lot of time reminding our players about this. We certainly aren't one of those teams that uh, – tells them not to interact. We think that's important. It's, it's a very unique way for our fans to interact with our fan base now. Um, I, I always say it's pretty much, it's today's, the young person's autograph is a retweet in, in many ways. You know, that's, that's what they're looking for. And it is, it's that one-to-one -one interaction that I think is good for sports because the money gets to be so big and it creates like this gap between what fans and, and the worlds that a fan lives in and an athlete lives in, and this can bring them together. But things like this, you know, there's some peril there that they have to be educated, and, you know, sometimes we'll slip off the tracks a little bit here or there, and you got to kind of guide them back on and explain why that might not have made sense. And, again, if you just, again, remind who they represent, a lot of times that sinks in. Yep, I would say ditto on, on most of them. We, we go through the training, we educate. Uh, we ended the training is a horror film of all the things you could do wrong that you shouldn't do wrong, uh, you know. But then someone has to go out there and and do it. An athlete will, uh, and will kind of find their own voice. They'll figure out what works for them, what doesn't work for them, uh, what got the fan base excited, what maybe didn't get them excited. Uh, they took a backlash, but they kind of figure that out a little bit on their own. Uh, as long as they don't make sort of the the big mistakes, I guess you're you're okay. Uh, all you can do is sort of you know it's it's free speech. All you can do is educate. Uh, you can't you know say you cannot do this or, or, or do this. At least for the CBA, you, there's limitations to what you can and cannot do. I can go Hawk Harrelson on you and give you a story. We 
we do this. We do this training, and the players are sometimes in stitches laughing uh, because every single spring training we do it. There's an NBA guy, and I, I won't give you his name, that decided to tweet out this awesome picture of this new back tattoo that he had. Okay, so he gets in the mirror, takes the picture in, in, in the mirror of this new awesome back tat that he has, and he's a free agent. And on the table right next to him is a great big bag of weed. I, and he just, he, 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 you can blow yourself up. And, you know, we, you know, we, we all, we sit around and like, this guy has millions of dollars and he doesn't have some place to put his weed. Uh, but this, you know, it's, it's, it's those types of things. And I think that's what AK was referring to is you show the guys, here's good, here's bad. Uh, your, your adults uh, make good choices. And it's, it's, you know, it's kind of the, sometimes, you know, the same thing you would tell your high school kids is yeah. <laughs> make good choices. Any more questions? Yes, we have one more. Please. I'm just curious about the, um, the stadium dynamics and what you guys see as the future. I mean, we're already seeing like the ballpark in Atlanta. They've moved out of there. What's the, what's the future? What are you doing to make sure that especially our historic parks like Soldier Field and Wrigley Field, but as well as at, at, at the cell and, and at Toyota Park, what are you doing to make sure that the stadium dynamics, we stay afraid of the, the forefront of that? You, you have, uh, what are you doing to make sure that this place is nice? Oh, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> obviously we went, went through the, the large scale after our 01 season and reopened in 03, and even, but now it's, that's 10 years ago, or more than 10 years ago, so it's about upgrading around. So we replaced the video boards uh, a couple years ago to make sure that that served our fan base at a, at a higher echelon of what's the expectation in, in other stadiums. And again, I mentioned Wi-Fi to make sure that those things are there. But you also want to be able to, I mean, I don't think there's a better venue to come to than on the lakefront in Chicago to come to a Bears game. On a, on a noon game in the fall, it doesn't get any better than this. And part of what makes it great is the older exterior and how intimate this stadium is. It's not one of these cavernous places, and, and we take a lot of pride in that, and we think our fans enjoy that as well. So, you know, Just from a, from a stadium technology standpoint, you know, 10 years in a stadium life these days is, yeah, a, is an eternity. eternity. Yeah, it's a long time. Uh, because just the way, uh, you know, not the steel has changed, but the tech has changed. So, you know, everything from hotspots to geotagging where you are to beacons to there is just mm. gizmos available that really can help you engage with the fans and increase and help with the, with the, with the experience. There are some teams, as a team in, in MLS that's testing or I think is doing a pretty decent job of it, uh, where, you know, they, they, like your media rights uh, outside the stadium are to, for, to, you know, given to a network. But, but within the stadium, uh, not necessarily, they aren't. Uh, so if you want to see a goal from four different angles, uh, 15 seconds right after the goal was scored, uh, their in-stadium app allows you to do that. They've got the cameras and a video room that cuts it and puts it out. All of a sudden, that's really cool. And uh, you, know, you make that available to maybe just season ticket holders and not to non-season ticket holders, and now you add a whole set of benefit for being a season ticket holder. So I think just the, the tech side of where the stadiums are going, you know, uh, is, is just changing at a rate, at a, at a drastic rate, uh, which, is, which is exciting to see, but puts us all in a place where you've got to, you know, uh, put a lot of capital investment in uh, day in, day out, to just to keep up with what is, what is, what is coming. We got time for one more question. You had a question? Hi, yes. Earlier you mentioned how you were getting your revenue from um, commercials and advertising. And I'm a DVR fan, so I use that to fast forward through those commercials. And I've always been curious as to what you're doing or what you plan to do to help still give that person that spot, even though we're fast forwarding through some of them, and still give them that value. The question is about, you know, what? how do you guys combat DVRs? And, and I'll just say from a broadcasting standpoint that the value of sports is that it's live. Yeah. If you look at 
the two most popular things from a rating standpoint on television, it's award shows and it's sports. And the reason, part of the reason is because people will second screen it live. Like you don't wanna be the person that misses the conversation on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram as something incredible is happening. At least I know from a broadcast standpoint, that's, that's one of the things that we look at why there's value to the broadcast rights of sports. Is that fair? That's, it's, it's, it's very fair, but you, you also when it comes to our, whether it's in-game uh, broadcast or our in-game presentations, you're seeing a lot more branded content that, that happens that you can subtly put into, uh, whether it's a broadcast or an in-game presentation. I think you're going to continue to see more and more and more of that as, as time goes. But sports is, it's the very best reality TV. And, and to Professor Holmes's point here, and if you guys don't know, you know Lawrence is not just a, a media whiz. He also teaches at DePaul. So he's, he's studied this probably way more than I have. There are ways to incorporate brand into the content. Branded content, you'll see more and more and more. And, and our, our team, our sales team does a great job in terms of it's, we integrate our partners into everything we do 365 days a year. So you're not just selling a TV spot. You're, you're understanding what goals that they're trying to meet and then incorporating their, them into a wide range of activities that your team participates in throughout the year. But to Lawrence's point, it's, it's hard to DVR a sports game just because it's really hard to avoid what the final score is or where it's at or anything else. It, that's one of the beauties of sports. Yeah, but I think none of us are selling a spot yeah. that we would be doing injustice to the partner if that's the only thing, that's the way we would package the deal. We would be selling it in a very different way. Yeah. So you can't avoid necessarily a, someone wants to DVR it, they could DVR it and they could skip over a spot. That's, you know, mm -hmm. there's no way around that. But you could try to figure out a way to reach that person four other different ways. So. Please thank our panel for this. Can I have one more second? Oh one wait, more. you have something yeah. else? One, 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 more, one more quick second. Is this about uh, my accent? This is not about, you got the coolest accent. Go with it. I'm rolling uh, with it, man. There are a couple of White Sox ticket sales people here. Where are you? Stand up real quick, okay? Stand up, Mike, you're tall, okay? Oh, there, there they are, all right? I know you have a lot of mingling to do, a lot of business to do, but the White Sox first pitch is at 710. If anybody here tonight wants to go to the game, two tickets on me, give your name to them, they'll leave them at will call. Okay? Wow. Nice work. Right. You guys got tickets? <laughs> Except <laughs> unless you work for the score. <laughs> Mitch, you can't, Mitch, you can't go. That was great, Brooks. thank you. And uh, thank you to the panelists. You guys were fabulous. I could have listened to this all night. It was so fascinating. As a big sports fan, it was great to hear how you uh, actually make the experience great for us. So thank you very much. And Lawrence, thank you. Thank you. What a great moderator. Everybody, the trade show will be open as soon as you get there. Drinks, food, and a lot of networking. Thank you for being here with us for this part. And we look forward to seeing you some more on the other side of the stadium. <laughs>